Okay, welcome back, folks. This is House Corrections and Institutions Committee. It is Wednesday, February 2nd. We have with us, um, we've shifted gears from buildings and general services to um, an area that we deal with in terms of facilities. For folks who uh, are in a mental health crisis and need uh, some therapeutic uh, situations. And that, that's where we look with our committee in terms of the construction end of some of those facilities. This is Mental Health Advocacy Day and Week, and we have some folks who have some lived experiences within the world of mental health with us today. We have three folks. And I will start with Kirk McVay. And Kirk, if you could identify yourself for the record, and then yes, after uh, the presentation, I'll ask the questions. So Kirk? my name is Kirk McVay. I'm the president of the Vermont Mental Health Counselors Association. I'm also co-chair of the American Mental Health Counselors Association Ethics Committee. And I have been working in Bennington as a mental health counselor for over 30 years. I have a lot of experience with uh, corrections. I have seen the clients I work with go in and out of the system. And uh, I have a lot to contribute to things that need to be changed in terms of mental health. Uh, this started for me when our Bennington County State Senator, Dick Sears, uh, some time ago, went into the correction system and asked people what they need. One of the themes that came up was counseling. And I sent him an email and explain that I have had people go into the system and once they are in there, I am cut off from providing counseling services to them. So he then got me in contact by email with uh, then interim director, Jim Baker. And Jim Baker sent me to someone in mental health in the system who didn't seem to understand what I was talking about, but simply told me, well, we don't screen who the inmates can talk to. So they would say to me, well, you can talk to them. But, you know, I mean, I'm a professional. I, I get paid for these services and uh, I can't just afford to give my time um, for, you know, for free services. So anyways, uh, I, went, he, I went back to Jim Baker and his last thing session to me was, well, where would the funding come from? Well, that's not my job. My job is to explain what I need at my end to provide my services, especially to those inmates who have, I, whom I was seeing. And then I go in, they go in to become incarcerated. And as I said, I'm cut off from seeing them. So something needs to be put into place to I mean, this is kind of a no brainer. I should be allowed to continue my work with people given the report that just came out explaining how bad the situation is with mental health in corrections and to say, well, you know, sorry, uh, just isn't good enough. I should be allowed to continue. And what I need at my end is, is pretty simple. I need a place to I can, where I can send preferably a HICFA form or even an invoice if I have to write one up so I can get paid for my services and have a session. And then on the other end, the inmate needs to be able to sit in front of a computer and have face-to-face -face contact me in a reasonably confidential setting. I believe they can already do that with their attorneys. So something needs to be set up to allow this to happen. I mean, it is, it is pretty simple. And uh, this may not be at your end of things. Oh, I was going to say the other thing that when the scandal hit regarding the previous medical services provider, I wrote to Jim and Paker when they were changing and says, well, now's the time to set this up. I got no response. I understand we now have a new commissioner of corrections. I am hoping that this person will do better. Um, okay, I am a little low on time. Uh, I just want to say that one of the reasons I've seen people go into corrections who probably didn't need to be there is lack of adequate uh, defense. Our legal defense is extremely poor. The public defenders are terribly overwhelmed. 
I've had people go in who, who didn't. I have one guy in three and a half years, three and a half years in Marble Valley waiting for trial. And he couldn't get a public defender to even look at his case. All they wanted to do is, is ask for a plea. And nobody wanted to take it to trial. Finally, they, they hired a private attorney who, once he looked at the case, said this is very weak and told the prosecution, if you go to trial, you're going to lose. And they agreed to a plea bargain for a much lesser charge for time served and let him out after three and a half years. Now, this is an embarrassment to me as a member of the state that the state is doing this to people and the lack of legal representation. And this is not an isolated story, unfortunately, from my own personal experience. OK, I'm ready for questions. Whew. I'm going to open it up to questions. I'm sure members have some. Kurt. How, how many clients would you have in the, in the correction system? Can you give me some idea of, of how much of a need there is? Uh, I'd say I've, I've seen maybe a half dozen people go, go in and come out in my time. Over how many years is this then? Uh, 20. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Karen and then Sarah. Yeah, Kirk, thank you for coming and sharing and for the work that you're doing with folks. Um, I certainly agree. Mental health um, is necessary for a lot of folks and is an important resource. I guess I'm trying to understand um, of what, what are the, the gaps in it? Because I think, yeah, it would be great if folks could have access to their mental health provider that they're familiar with. But I guess for me, there's a lot of questions around like, how does it work for, for billing? Can, can um, you know, Medicare or insurance cover that if they're under the supervision of DS? So, so these are like bigger things than us, I think, just saying this can happen. So um, I'm wondering what kind of research and stuff um, is needed for that. So it seems like it's a bigger nut to crack. So D Dick Sears told me that uh, once you're incarcerated, you're cut off from Medicaid. So the funding has to come from somewhere else. And again, that's not my job to figure that out. Um, but something needs to be set up for this to happen. And you may have to work with the commissioner of corrections, the new one, to figure this out. I need a place to send a bill or a claim form to get paid for my services. And I can sit here, you know, in my right now, I'm in my home office and talk to an inmate who needs to be in a, a, a place where they can have some confidential conversation with me. And I, I, I believe those do exist um, for talking to their attorneys. So this, this is what needs to happen, but I, I can't tell you any more than that about what has to happen at the other end. I'm not inside. Yeah. So uh, thank you, Mr. McVeigh, for coming in and speaking to us. We, we've definitely heard, you know, the, there, there's so much overlap uh, in connection between mental health needs and um, folks who are justice involved. Um, I don't know if you're aware that with the state of Vermont, folks, when they become incarcerated, Medicaid and Medicare does, no longer covers them. It is picked up by the state, but it's also, a, we, have a men, we have a health contract with a provider. And I'm just wondering, maybe you can help us figure this out a little bit because um, I think it would have to be like a relationship that you could be a subcontractor of this provider in some way. And that, that I, don't, I don't know how that gets worked out or it's, we, I know we recently re-entered a new contract. Um, uh, and so I don't know when that contract is up, but uh, um, and I know that we provide mental health services in our facilities. So I think, anyway, it's good to hear that you're, to hear your perspective. Um, and and I, uh, both with the, the access to therapy and also representation. Representation is a, a little bit outside of our committee's jurisdiction. It's the Judiciary Committee that would probably um, have deeper insights on how people could be better represented. Um, um, have you have you ever? I understand that you want us to figure this out, but have you 
um, what, what is the name of our, our provider? It's, uh, it's, uh, it's not Core Civic. No, it's, um, that's it's, gone. Uh, oh, I can never remember it either. It's a new Viacon. One. Is a Viacon? No, it's similar to Viacon. It's not. I can't remember. I. It's a small. It starts with a B. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can't remember. I'm sorry. So, Kurt, when when you're seeing someone in your private practice and then they become incarcerated, the person that you were seeing prior to being incarcerated, were they uh, covered by private insurance? Were they covered by Medicaid? Medicaid. No, everybody who's ever, I've ever seen go into corrections uh, was covered by Medicaid. By Medicaid. And that whenever anyone is incarcerated, all of their insurance goes away. Correct. It's not covered by the state's right. network. So yeah, I mean, it sounds like, you know, something needs to be negotiated with your contractor. And yes, uh, you know, I'd be willing to sign, uh, to sign a subcontract, uh, you know, if, even if I get paid uh, the Medicaid rates. I mean, that would be satisfactory since that's what I was getting paid before the person went in. So in your experience of seeing folks that were your clients and then were incarcerated, have they been requesting uh, the DOC and the medical contractor, have they been requesting that they want to continue with you? As oh, their, yes. Uh, and the other thing that comes up is, you know, some people have some pretty bad ADHD, one of the things that lands them in corrections. And uh, they can't get their medications that they were being prescribed on the outside while they're on the inside. Uh, they, the corrections just doesn't allow it. Vital core. I got it. It's vital core. I knew it started with a V. M and M's. Yeah. Um, I mean, part a part of the insurance issue. It's not driven by the state. It's driven by the feds. I understand um, that. Um, I mean, I think Sarah's. Coffee, Representative Coffey's point is well taken that it's a conversation with our medical provider and the contract that they've negotiated with the state in terms of what is covered. And maybe you could be a subcontractor with Vital Core. I don't know. That may be a conversation that needs to occur for that. Uh, Karen? Yeah, and I feel like this conversation for me is also reinforcing the um, idea of really working to um, prevent folks from entering into incarceration when we can so that, again, they're not losing connection to these services. So I see that it's kind of twofold. One, let's work on having folks be as successful as they can once they're incarcerated, but how can we really be like thinking critical about, is it necessary for somebody to be incarcerated? Because I think as you're sharing, folks get cut off from some really important services. Well, plus continuity of care. I mean, they should have somebody, if you're, if you're seeing someone within corrections, that person then won't be available to you once you're out of corrections. So again, setting up, uh, whether it's with the community mental health center or private um, uh, practitioners uh, in their community. So uh, when they come out, they're already connected with someone and can get some help um, navigating uh, life after incarceration which can be very difficult to set up. But, you know, thank goodness for Pathways. They've done a great job with uh, some of the people I've seen that come out. Well, when you're dealing in a therapeutic setting, it's, it's really a relationship of trust. Exactly. And once that person that you've really, as a patient, that you've really put your trust in, and once that person's not available to you, a lot of your life starts to fall apart. So I'm gonna move on here um, because I'm looking at our time and we are a little limited. So Danielle, um, I'm gonna shift it over to you and if you could just identify yourself for the record. Sure, my name is Danielle Caton and I am the Program Director of Substance Use and Criminal Justice Services at Clara Martin Center, a designated agency in, that serves Orange and Windsor counties. So thanks for the invitation to be here today. My hope was to, and the ask for me joining, was to talk about the importance of 
the ability to deliver substance use counseling, therapy, treatment support via telemedicine throughout the pandemic, and really the crucial role that, that flex those flexibilities have played throughout the past two years in supporting people with substance use issues. Uh, here we work with people who have intersection between substance use, criminal justice, and mental health disorders that they're receiving treatment for. And we, we could not have supported folks effectively without the flexibility of telemedicine that was available to us throughout the pandemic. So I'm also reflecting on the amount of fatal opiate overdoses within the year of 2021. And those numbers came out a few weeks ago. And just wanting to acknowledge that by October of last year, we had already surpassed the amount of fatal overdoses um, that occurred within the entire year of 2020. And to mention that those, those numbers are rising at a scary rate within our state and specifically within Windsor County, which is where I'm based. So, there were a lot of benefits to being able to provide SUD, substance use disorder treatment throughout the pandemic. The most obvious one being to reduce the risk of transmission of COVID and help keep staff healthy and also support clients in staying healthy. But there are really some longer term benefits of this flexibility to do telemedicine with this demographic that are important to look at. Um, one being just access to care. People's access to receiving support with telemedicine improved dramatically with this population. Um, the other one would be the convenience that telemedicine offers to clients who have work demands. Um, there's a lot more convenience to be able to do your therapy remotely and to not have to sacrifice an, an hour at work or an entire day at work in order to get treatment that people need. Obviously, it's reduced barriers around childcare issues, which is another crisis within our state. Um, so it supported people with children who could not leave their home to come on site to do services to getting access to treatment. And then I would say that specifically telemedicine with our substance use population increased access to life-saving medications, specifically buprenorphine throughout the pandemic and made the difference between people being able to receive that life-saving medication. So I also wanna mention that it is, it is clear and our, our treatment providers within the state acknowledge that telemedicine cannot and should not replace uh, in-person service delivery. Um, it is important to look at how we can develop a hybrid system within our agencies to offer a mix of telemedicine and in-person services. We still need to be able to um, support people who just based on patient preference prefer in-person services for their treatment. We need to be able to see higher risk folks who really need that in-person support as well for access to harm reduction materials like Narcan and sterile needles, et cetera. Um, we need to support people who don't have privacy within their homes and telemedicine. Uh, that can be a limitation for some patients that they don't have the private space. And then the other barrier that we face is working with people who have limited to no access to cell phone service or broadband service. And that is an issue that, that continues um, to affect people statewide in terms of their access. So lastly, I'll just mention that in terms of studies and research, there, has, there have been a lot of studies that have been done on the efficacy of treating mental health disorders via telemedicine. And they, they indicate really positive outcomes overall. As far as studies and research on implementing telemedicine with the substance use disorder population, there have been a lot fewer studies done to look at what those outcomes are. So that's a missing piece. Um, and I'm hopeful that there's plenty of data 
throughout COVID to be able to look at the effectiveness of using telemedicine with all people who are engaging in treatment. But it is really, really important for providers to have flexibility to continue offering telemedicine and then to continue getting reimbursed for those services so that we can we can continue offering them and keep our staff and retain our staff to be able to provide those. So a hybrid approach where we're reimbursed for services that are more accessible to clients would be the hope post pandemic and ongoing because there is a very, very high need uh, for this type of treatment and support within our communities to keep people healthy. So with that, I think I'm at time or maybe close to it. So that's all I have. Thanks for inviting me and thanks for um, facilitating this conversation. It's really important. Thank you, Danielle. And I think there is a lot of support for telemed um, across the spectrum. I think it's, it's really important. I think um, the pandemic has really shown how a vital tool it is for everyone. Uh, questions? Uh, Michelle. Um, yeah, Danielle, you mentioned uh, that you've worked with people with the DOC population, and I'm just wondering, it sounds like there would very likely be the same problem that Kirk has encountered, where if somebody becomes incarcerated, you then can no longer work with them. Is, is that true, or has there been a way you've been able to use telemedicine in conjunction with people who are incarcerated? So I would say that we face the same challenges that Kirk described. There was a point uh, before I was at Clara Martin Center, but we were able to support clients in assessing them while they're incarcerated um, for re-entry needs before exiting uh, corrections. And we were able to do that and get paid for that. I believe it was the same subcontractor situation, but that was crucial. Um, the funding went away for that, uh, sadly, but really trying to support people in reentry after they've exited corrections or the facility is it's already too late. You're already behind the game um, in being able to help them reacclimate into their communities again. So I would echo a lot of what Kirk shared today. Alice, can I ask a question? Mary, thank you. Okay. For any of you, I know the new commissioner is fairly new, but have you set up a time to speak with him and uh, the appropriate folks within corrections at this point? Mary, is your question to me? I think it's probably to all of you, you know, in, in the request for meetings or for, you know, some kind of resolve to come out of this. Have you had the opportunity to reach out yet? And I would say probably all of you, because you're from different areas, can probably respond to it. So I, I, what I would tell you is I didn't even know that there was a new commissioner of uh, corrections until like about two days ago. So I was assuming that it was still Jim Baker and I got nowhere with him. So uh, if someone wants to introduce me, get me in touch by email, I'm willing to give it another try. Okay, can you look to send your email to our clerk in our, or our assistant in our room um, so that, you know, we can at least provide the information that you can reach out to them, the new commissioner and whoever else can look at this? Sure. Yes, so I, I, think I, I think the way to do it, Phil, do you have their emails? These yes, respect, I do. Okay. So... The person that Mary is referring to as our committee assistant is Phil Petty. So you would have received notification from his email about our meeting today. And he can send you the email contact for Commissioner Demo. I have a hard time with his last name, Commissioner Nick. 
and Phil can send all you folks uh, the contact information for the Commissioner of Department of Corrections. So that's a good point that, that Mary brings up. If you could connect with the commissioner directly. With your that would be appreciated. Thank you. Experiences and concerns. Any further questions, Karen? Yes, I was going to um, share. Definitely supportive of the idea of um, telehealth, mental service. Like I think that is important. I guess my question is, um, I feel like it's also a little bit out of our jurisdiction in kind of addressing any of the barriers with it. It seems like that probably would be more for the healthcare committee. Um, and my also my understanding is that I feel like we just passed legislation that extended allowing telehealth for I think another year or so. So I'm, I'm wondering kind of what the question or the ask is, and this might be Danielle directed towards you, is, is it's allowed now to be able to provide substance abuse counseling via telehealth is, are you asking for it to be a permanent thing? And have you had a chance to talk with the healthcare committee? Um, Cause I think I, I can at least speak for myself. I'm supportive of it, but I also feel like I don't have a, a way I can help you through this committee. Sure, I would say that uh, we've had great conversations mm -hmm. with ADAP at the Vermont Department of Health, who's they're doing a lot of advocacy to support the state preferred providers and having, you know, being allowed to continue providing telemedicine services as long as we can. I just think that the important piece is uh, to look at permanency around telemedicine and really speaking about allowances in a permanent way. Um, and I know that's a, even just permanent is a, um, you know, that's a, a word that we could toss around in different ways, but, um, I think in the broader picture within our state, specific to workforce, specific to obviously healthcare, um, specific to our aging population, telemedicine and treatment just impacts a ton of different populations and a, and a lot of different committees in terms of what their interests are. Um, so however we can work together with, whether it's the healthcare committee or your committee, any, any committee, to support that goal, we we just like to see it extended. I'll say that that it's it's great that the telemedicine piece has been um, extended for the next year. But in terms of working with private insurers, even last July, we already began to see uh, limitations start start to be put back into place around what sort of support we could provide and. Um, Who's, who's eligible for telemedicine and, and which provider can do it, but this provider can't. So those limitations have already started phasing back in to our service delivery, which is concerning. Um, we all understand that, that some of the flexibility is going to go away. For example, providing audio only services. You know, of course, that's not on parity, on, on par with in person or even telehealth. So there are some that we expect to not have that flexibility around ongoing, but it, it makes a lot of treatment providers nervous to already have begun to see um, payers begin to draw back their support of us being able to provide the amount of services we've been able to deliver. So the whole issue of telemed is, is really a little bit beyond our committee. It's good to understand what you're experiencing, particularly in the substance use disorder world. And I'm sure some of that is also co-occurring with mental health issues as well. It's really driven by what insurances would reimburse the provider for. And I know our healthcare committee has been looking at this and also it's dealing with regulation with insurance companies, which also, involves our commerce committee, which would deal with this. So we can share this concern with our colleagues in those committees, <clears throat> um, but I need to move this along because we have Megan that we want to hear from and we only have about 10 more minutes. We want to offer some time here. So thank you, Danielle. Uh, Megan, if you could just introduce yourself for the record and uh, finish us up here. I'll try. 
I'm Megan Holmston. I am from Washington County Mental Health. I am uh, the director of our Children, Youth and Family Service Residential Treatment Programs. Um, I have a lot of notes that I'm gonna ignore, I think. So, and, and get right to it, because uh, I know we're out of time. Um, Washington County currently has 20 licensed beds uh, spread among six different programs or locations. We serve youth uh, from five up to 20. Uh, many of the kids that we serve um, are involved in the justice system. Um, and unfortunately that system does not work for our kids and has failed our kids uh, greatly. Um, about two years ago, maybe three years now, uh, because of Woodside and what was happening, the state came to Washington County and asked us to start a program that was um, really specialized towards serving youth that would typically be in a detention type model, uh, but with more of a mental health uh, high acuity. Um, those beds have been full for the past three years. Uh, we have never had a day without a kid in that bed. Um, we have found that uh, the kids have been incredibly, have done incredibly well within that environment. Um, we are able to, and I think what kids that are in, involved in the justice system need are the ability for folks to look at them as who they are and not the crimes. And unfortunately, uh, when the kids are in the system, we, we see them as purely their crimes. Uh, you know, I, I unfortunately sometimes that that comes across my desk where we have kids that already at 17 have 35 different charges. Um, some of them are pretty significant charges. And um, this program uh, allows us to be able just to provide them safety, uh, calmness, uh, and, and friendly faces where they have the chance to, to really take the time to think about what they need, why they've been struggling, and to put together a plan so that they can be successful uh, when they are out of our program or out of the system. Um, I will say that I understand that the um, EDs are having a hard time. We have a lot of kids boarding there for, for weeks, uh, sometimes months. And I will say that uh, we do have a program that was built to help with that. And because of workforce issues, as I think everyone can talk about, uh, that program has temporarily shut down. Um, and so we're not able to provide that uh, service to EDs. And so we are looking for some support so that we can increase workforce so that we can have our programs running at full capacity so we can serve as many kids as possible um, in the system. Um, I think, is there any questions? That was pretty oh, yeah. quick. No, that's fine. Um, the The program that you're offering to uh, justice involved juveniles in Washington County, how many beds are being used? And is it is it sure, it's for licensed kids? for two beds? Pardon? Two beds. It's two beds. very small. Mm -hmm. Is it for kids from just Washington County, or is it statewide? This is a, it's a statewide program um, in, in DCFR is the placing agency. So they come to our door has, through DCF. Has there um, been a no refusal option at all for some of the kids or, and or <coughs> some of the juveniles that are coming in, they, they're not uh, able to stay in the bed for a variety of reasons that maybe it's too hard to handle and then where do they go? So it's sort of a two, two prong approach. Right. So our, our contract with the state is a no eject reject program. We do have a, a 72 hour emergency uh, clause in that contract. And I will say that we have not needed to uh, invoke that, that contract, uh, part of the contract. What I will say is that um, what we have heard about the kids that come to us is that they've had a, a, an incredibly hard time stabilizing. Uh, their behaviors have um, been, uh, they've been aggressive or um, a lot of self-injury. Uh, and when they come and land in our program, uh, again, we've had a great success with the youth um, and have not had any behavioral concerns for the most part uh, when kids are with us. 
So you have two beds that would address the statewide issue. In your perfect world, how many beds should be out there? Two obviously is not perfect. <laughs> In a perfect world, I, I think that this is, you know, I, I've, I've been doing this for 23 years. I've worked with Woodside for a very long time. And, I, and again, I think we can't go back to a model where we're trying to create, you know, this adult model, which really doesn't work for adults and put kids in it. And so ideally we would have um, more beds, you know, I think three would be the top um, and they would be located around the state because again, kids, kids need an opportunity to grow and to show their strengths. Um, and if you have a smaller setting with a smaller ratio with staff, they have that opportunity to make some real growth, to not enter the system as adults again. So you're saying three beds wide or three beds per region? Per region. Per region, okay. That's a differentiation. And that those beds are flexible in terms of the structure and the programming. Correct. Okay, questions? Sure. Can you give me an idea of how long um, one of your clients might be in your facility? Sure. Just so in, sure, uh, in, in the facility that we're, we were just discussing, which is T-Rock, uh, I think some folks know it as Turtle Rock, uh, our contract is up to 45 days. So we've had youth that have been in the bed maybe one week, um, up to 30 days to 45 days. Unfortunately, there's such placement crisis in the state. I don't think the state's able to utilize the bed as much as for the population that they were looking at. You know, we've had to be very diverse with the kids that we work with. That license is five to 16 or 17. We've had a lot of kids from the DS world come into our beds to utilize that bed because it, there's nothing else for them currently. That was my next question. I was wondering where they, where they go from your facility or, and how backed up those are. Okay. Sure. So I, I think the one thing I've heard from the state, uh, a lot of these youth uh, are uh, still in court. And I think that they're fighting, uh, you know, the state's plan is to send a lot of these youth out of state because, again, there's not facilities open in Vermont or they're closing because of lack of workforce. Uh, and so they're making the argument to send these youth out of state. Um, they do so well in our program. I think that argument gets harder for the state to make for those youth. And I will say that I, it's not, a, I think about us as individuals. I think it's really about the program and the environment that they're in and they're not in a, in that DOC type Woodside environment. It's not as institutionalized. <laughs> Correct. Other questions? <clears throat> well, thank you, Megan. And we're right on time. That's pretty good. <laughs> I want to thank all three of you. I think you've touched on all different angles in terms of corrections, mental health, juvenile justice, um, and medical care in terms of uh, telehealth. So I think this has been a well-rounded uh, presentation and discussion. And I really want to thank all three of you for this. And we may be reaching out to a few of you as we proceed. Who knows? But I know that um, two of you definitely, Kurt and Danielle, will be receiving, but particularly Kurt will be receiving an email from Phil about connections with the commissioner of DOC. And um, then you folks can then take it from there. And Megan, I think your testimony on the justice involved juveniles has been very appropriate as we try to figure out how we go forward in replacing um, the bad needs now that Woodside has been closed and what's the best model for us to pursue. I think that your comments have been very helpful in that arena as well. So anything else before we Can I ask a quick, Sorry, just one quick question for Megan. I'm wondering, you said that, you know, the perfect world model would, would be like up to three beds. 
Um, I'm wondering, do you feel like it would, right, right, regionally, but I'm just saying, like, do you think it would be possible to have that more intimate and nurturing environment if we did have a slightly bigger place? So for example, five to seven beds, um, or do you feel like really, if you get beyond that, you're not going to be able to have the intimacy that you need to um, impact the positive outcomes? I think it's, it's doable. I, you know, I think in our, our long-term treatment programs where we have kids that pop in and out, um, we yeah. have up to four beds. I'm yeah, sorry, there's some, some feedback. Yeah, we got some uh, technical, issues. technical issues with the microphone here. So speak okay. again and... I'll, I'll try. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I would ideally keep it to, to four to five beds and it's really going to be about the environment and the people in that environment and if and some flexibility within that own milieu. I think is when you get larger, you need to think about who is with who and what makes the most sense um, for that for that milieu at that time. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Any other questions? before we shift gears here. So thank you folks. We really appreciate you taking time out of your day to Zoom in with us. It's been very helpful and feel free to reach out to your legislative body at any time. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, so we have some technical issues happening here. So before we move on, I don't know, um, so, welcome folks. Um, we are still live on YouTube and we do have a document on our webpage and it's under Rachel Feldman. And um, we are going to hear the survey results of what is from the PRIN project, which is Pris Prison Research Innovative Innovation Network. Network. <laughs> it's like, I don't know if network is the right word. And they've been working along with some folks at UNF, um, working within our correctional facilities. Um, and they, they're working out of the Springfield facility in particular, um, working with both inmates and staff and trying to um, get a basis in terms of what the needs are for offenders and the needs are for staff and also sort of the morale issues and issues around how supported inmates feel, issues around how supported our staff feel. So this has been ongoing for a couple of years now. Of course, the COVID issue has impacted that a little bit where it really limited the person-to-person -person contacts and interviews. Um, but they were very successful in achieving some of their goals. So I'm going to turn it over to the commissioner to introduce the folks who are with us. Um, and then you folks can take it from there. So whenever anyone first starts to speak, please uh, just identify yourself for the record. So commissioner. Good morning. Uh, hopefully you can still hear us okay. Uh, pleasure to be here again today. Uh, sorry that I had to dip out a little early yesterday, but I know you were in good hands with Matt D'Agostino. Um, so we have some folks from the Department of Corrections here with me today, uh, and we also have our partners from the Urban Institute and from the University of Vermont. Uh, so uh, I'm Nick Demmel. I'm the Commissioner of the Vermont Department of Corrections. I'll pass it to my colleagues from the DOC, and then uh, we can go through and just do quick introductions, and then I'd be happy to come back and, and begin our presentation. Um, so let's see, Monica, do you want to go next? Sure. Good morning, everyone. I'm Monica Weaver. I'm the Administrative Services Director for the Department of Corrections. Uh, I'm Brad Goodhale. I am the PRIM, the Prison Research Innovation Network Manager based out of Springfield and the Project Manager for PRIM. Uh, Rachel, are you on here? Rachel's mm -hmm. way at the bottom here on our screen. There she goes. I am Rachel right. Feldman. I am the Principal Assistant and Public Information Officer for the Department of Corrections. Um, and then if our partners from the University of Vermont would like to go next, I can hand it to them. 
Hi, I'm Abby Crocker. I'm a professor of statistics at the University of Vermont. Hi. Uh, I'm Kathy Fox. I'm a professor of sociology at the University of Vermont. And then finally, our friend from the Urban Institute, Jesse. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Jesse Janetta. I'm a senior policy fellow at the uh, Urban Institute's Justice Policy Center. We're a social policy research organization based in D.C. And among other things I do there, I am leading our, our work with Vermont uh, on the PRIN project. Good to see everyone today. So you'll get to hear a little bit more from all of our partners here in just a moment, but I just wanted to provide some framing for the conversation. Um, so last week, the Vermont Department of Corrections, the University of Vermont, and the Urban Institute released the initial findings of the Prison Research and Innovation Network uh, in Vermont. These were the first initial findings of this project nationwide, and so we're excited that Vermont was on the front end uh, of this effort. Vermont is one of five states participating in this five-year effort uh, to build evidence and spur innovation to make prisons more humane, safe, and rehabilitative. Uh, there are a couple of primary goals of the network, um, and they are to understand prison environments and the safety and well-being for those who live and work there, uh, to help prisons collect data to promote transparency and accountability, and to support evidence-based changes to improve prisons, such as ensuring the safe and humane treatment for all. In pursuit of these goals, the project enlisted the input of staff and incarcerated individuals at Southern State Correctional Facility in Springfield in the research study design and the initial review of the findings, and will continue to do so toward the development of recommendations for improvement. Um, from my perspective, I couldn't be prouder that our state, uh, the Vermont Department of Corrections and our staff was willing to pursue this effort uh, and evaluate our system and innovate new solutions with the goal of making really meaningful improvements. Um, I view this truly as an act of courage. Uh, and I think it sends the message to all who are watching that we care about our future as a state and as a department uh, and corrections professionals, and we wanna get it right. Um, I firmly believe that until we understand the challenges we're facing, we can't begin to design and implement effective transformational changes. And this effort provides us that unique opportunity to understand, to innovate, and to improve. Um, I think it's worth noting that these results capture the feelings, pressures, the positives and negatives of a point in time in June of 2021. Um, when we're in the throes of the COVID-19 pandemic. And since that time, the pandemic has continued to impact everything that we do. So we can't talk about these results without considering the pandemic context surrounding them. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have a pre-pandemic version of this study to compare notes to. So as we digest these findings, we know that the pandemic played an outsized role and has had an outsized impact on many of the issues that we will discuss today. Um, but in furtherance of our abiding commitment to transparency, <clears throat> we wanted to share these results with you. Uh, last week, we were able to share them with our own staff. We've shared them with those in the care and custody of the department. Um, and today, we look forward to discussing them with you uh, in this forum. So from here, we will move into the next phase of the project, and that's the beginning of the innovation period. Uh, and we look forward to sharing those results with you as well. Um, but today we're here to discuss the current progress we've made on this effort and the research that we've uh, revealed so far. I wanted to take a moment though before I hand it off to thank our team at the Department of Corrections for their support and their participation in this project, uh, to the incarcerated population at Southern State for their contributions to our effort, uh, and to our partners here, the University of Vermont and the Urban Institute for courageously collaborating with us on this effort. Uh, I am extremely proud of the progress we've made and I look forward to the innovations that we're able to take on together in this next phase. So to talk a little more about the project itself, I'll hand it over to my colleagues from the department, uh, Brad and Monica, and then we can hand it to our partners uh, from there. <clears throat> Thank you, Commissioner. Um, good morning, everyone. Again, I'm Monica Weber, the Administrative Services Director for the department. And um, I thought I'd just take a few moments to give you a little bit of background about you know, how and why we started the project um, before we kind of get into the, um, 
the discussion of the climate survey results. Um, some of you may remember um, in 2019, uh, there were lots of conversations around um, prison reform, um, prison transformation. And at the time, uh, Commissioner Touchette um, had really made that a priority um, um, for his um, time period as commissioner and had been working with our partners at UVM on a variety of projects um, are just around um, prison reform. And during these conversations, the, the opportunity to apply um, for this program through the Urban Institute became available. And so we uh, worked together in August to submit an application um, based on the requirements of the RFP that Ur Urban put out. Um, and we were awarded, uh, thankfully, and we were one of the five states across the country who was, who was awarded um, the grant. Um, and then um, took a little bit of time to uh, do some administrative work. But um, in February of 2020, I think it was actually one of the last things that we did in person before COVID, um, we all went down to Southern State Correctional Facility and had a really successful and nice launch um, with the staff and the incarcerated population at the facility. Um, I recall that as being a very nice event. I'm sure other people will probably um, chime in about that too. Um, and the reason we uh, selected Southern, there, there's a number of reasons we selected. And um, I don't wanna just say that the only reason we did it is because it met the criteria that were in the RFP that Urban put out. Um, they did have a requirement, and Jesse can speak a little bit to this, that the um, size of the facility be at least 300 um, incarcerated population. So as you all know, in, in Vermont, there aren't many options that meet those criteria. Um, however, Southern really did provide us with a great opportunity for a lot of reasons. Um, one, we had a very good leadership team there, and we knew that that leadership team would um, be, uh, you know, sort of all in on this project. It really does require the team to, to participate very, very much. Um, and we had also acknowledged that Southern um, had some limitations, as you were all aware. Um, we know that it lacks you know, industry um, and career and work readiness um, opportunities for people. Um, and so we wanted to you know, sort of focus on, on that. And um, it also just provides us with just about anything that you could possibly imagine in a correctional facility. So it was a good um, test pilot site. Um, so that, that's one of the reasons why the Southern um, facility was selected for this project. We're happy that it's there. Uh, so as we started to move through 2020, as the commissioner mentioned, um, the pandemic crit hit us pretty hard and we worked with our collaborators, um, partners at UVM and Urban to um, get some of the sort of nuts and bolts things in shape, contracts, sending over administrative data and also hiring. And in the uh, fall of 2020, we did hire Brad Goodhale, who introduced himself to you as the Prison Research Innovation Manager. And he's the on the grounds person. He is there at the facility, working in the facility, talking to the folks, um, the staff and the incarcerated population there. And we'll also be moving forward on um, managing the, the innovation process as we move into the into phase two. So I'll just uh, leave it there just so you have a little bit of that context. And I'm not sure who's going to go next. I think unless Brad, you had anything you wanted to add there. Um, no, we, I think Jesse would be next in the lineup. So hand it over to Jesse and Urban. Great. Thank you, Monica. So <clears throat> What I'd like to do from the position of being part of the Urban Institute, which is the national coordinator of this uh, print work with, uh, with the support and funding from Arnold Ventures, is to give a little bit of what I think might be some helpful contextual things about the national uh, nature of the project and where some of this came from, from our perspective that may be helpful to the committee and everyone watching in understanding why we did what we did and what we're sharing here and what it means. So. Um, <laughs> The idea of the PRIN was to create a community of practice for states that were interested in leveraging research data and evidence to inspire uh, improvements in their prison environments. In addition to Vermont, the other four states that are participating um, in, in the project right now are Colorado, uh, Delaware, 
Iowa and Missouri. I'd also uh, note um, Vermont, as as I know you're aware, is one of the the few unified correction systems in the United States. Delaware is also a unified system, so we do have one that at least has uh, that similarity to uh, Vermont's system. Um, as the commissioner said, one of the key things in the overall arc of the project in each of the states is to design and implement and evaluate data-driven operational and programmatic innovations and changes to improve uh, prison conditions. And the climate survey that we're here talking about today is one of the foundational pieces of data that is going to drive that work. Um, when we uh, invited all the jurisdictions to apply and throw their hat in the ring in the competitive process from which we selected Vermont and the other states. One of the things that we asked at the front end and have continued to emphasize is to try as much as possible to do the research in a participatory manner. And what participatory research methods mean is in contrast to what has been a more traditional way of doing research where people who are the subject of research can be treated as subjects or the source of data to really push as much as possible to have uh, the communities, the populations being researched be partners in the research, meaning they have a say in what the issues are that are going to be investigated, what that looks like, that they have sort of the first opportunity to see results of that research, to be ones to provide feedback um, on interpretation on that and what they think it means and what's most important to them. And then going outside of the research, but one thing that we've, um, we're all working uh, on a commitment to and to really operationalize is also have them have that participatory engagement in what changes are going to be made in response to this research. And one thing I would say is this is closely tied, the desire to do the work in that way is closely tied to the way we set up the structure to have a single pilot facility in each of the states to be the focus of the work, feeling that in order to really do that kind of methods and to do that kind of deep engagement work, it was unlikely that we were going to be able to successfully as partners do that across an entire system, that to really do that the work in that way and for other reasons would probably require focusing um, in a single place. By and large, the survey that was done in Vermont was developed uh, locally here uh, by the University of Vermont in partnership with staff um, and incarcerated people at Southern State. Um, but I say by and large, there were uh, drawing from research um, that already existed on doing surveys in correctional environments. Uh, we at, at Urban looked through all of that, used that to provide some guidance. And we also asked each of the print states to include some common items in all the surveys. We felt that we would be missing a real opportunity to build knowledge about uh, prison environments in the United States if we didn't ask to have at least some consistency uh, across the surveys. But we really wanted to keep that tight into a minimum so that we could really hold the space for the work, um, the survey instruments to be locally developed and really reflect the interests of the people who would be uh, taking the surveys. So if I may make just a few observations from uh, my perspective um, in the national project. One is I do wanna say that from my perspective, everyone in the partnership really stayed committed to this process throughout under tremendously trying circumstances. Certainly Vermont, none of the states that applied to be part of this project thought that it would be easy. That was very clear. That was stated you know, very directly in Vermont's application, but nobody expected that they were going to be doing this work in the context of a global pandemic that was causing all sorts of damage and, and harm and social disruption generally and hit correctional facilities particularly hard. That offered a lot of reasons to not do the work at all or to really pull back on some of the participatory and other envelope pushing and challenging uh, methods. But that's not what happened. If anything, I think everybody really showed how committed they were to doing that way and figuring it out. And certainly there were things we would have done if we could have been in person um, that we weren't able to do and that we may do in the future. But really, I, I, from my perspective, everybody really showed up to figure out how to do the work consistent with these principles to the greatest degree possible. I think getting this rich data with around a little over 70% uh, response rate from both the staff and incarcerated populations 
is a tremendous accomplishment. Getting 70% responses from surveys of anyone, anywhere, at any time is good. Under the circumstances that we were dealing, I, I really think it's it's tremendously impressive. And I also want to commend all the partners who respected the independence of the research team uh, at UVM, which I think really maintained the integrity of the research process without. I just want to second, transparency has been a core uh, value of this project. And this is really, you know, the release of, of this information is uh, as challenging as much of it is, really represents a critical milestone in that transparency component of the project. Um, and finally, one of my hopes, and I think one of the project's hopes is that this survey, so now we're in this position where we only have the one-time snapshot of what it is. And when you've got baseline, even though you're going to do it again, that's sort of the most limited time that you have to sit with the data. But one of the things that I think this survey and its existence will allow Vermont to do going forward is not just to understand what issues are there. And I think many of them that are, are in the survey are not new news to people, although I think seeing them quantitatively in this way may have it hit a little different. But really, part of what this is doing is creating new capacity to start to answer questions about some of these things like, is it different next year than it is, Nick? this year? What about five years from now? Are these things going in a positive direction to really measure and sort of manage to improvement of them? So I'll just conclude by saying that now it's our collective responsibility to use this data to make meaningful changes, meaningful meaning that they are meaningful to the staff at SSCF and the people incarcerated at SSCF. We know that's the people, that's what the people at Southern who helped develop the survey and the many more who made the time to complete it and, and provide the data, we're able to talk about it. That's what they expect from us. And that's you know what we owe to them for what they've already given to the project. So with that uh, national framing, which I appreciate the opportunity to provide to you all, I wanna pass it to um, our partners uh, at the University of Mervant. Thank you. I can, I can get us kicked off, Kathy, and then I'll pass it over to you. Um, so I'm Abby Crocker at the University of Vermont. And um, you know, I really appreciate the, the framing set up by our partners at DOC and Urban. There's like a lot said, but part of me is like, what do we have to add? But um, I just want to highlight a few things specifically, like why uh, Kathy and I were really interested in this project. Um, you know, we are very committed to using applied research and data for um, meaningful social systems change. And, and this seemed like a like the, the perfect opportunity for that. Um, we were really interested and prioritized the participatory approach, understanding that you know a lot of times systems change has been tried from top down or sort of outside at, and this participatory nature really ensures that the the voices of those inside the facility, the folks who sort of know the system best, are the ones who are identifying issues and actually you know part of that process and highlighting those voices. So I just wanted to give a little bit of background about how we use that process to develop the survey. Um, essentially what we did was we did interviews and focus groups, over 30 of them um, with staff and incarcerated at Southern in um, late fall of 2020 and sort of early 2021. And basically in those interviews and focus groups, we're really looking to see like what mattered to everyone inside. If we were to describe the prison climate um, in order to identify opportunities for change, what was important to the folks inside? That's how we wanted to ground what the survey questions were gonna be. So we went in with that sort of framing um, and, and we got a lot of really rich information and we were able to then identify, you know, what were the priority domains? What are the questions we should be asking? We then partnered with community research councils and these were folks we identified in the facility, staff and incarcerated, to really help us take that information and develop actual surveys. Um, and, and so when you see the surveys themselves, the questions come from those inside. It wasn't like we decided what domains to explore, they did. And that's how we developed the survey. Um, and you know, we were able to incorporate those questions that Jesse mentioned from Urban to make sure that the surveys um, not only were helpful for local change, but also were contributing to sort of the national conversation about corrections reforms. Um, when we actually administered the survey that was done in, in June of 2021, uh, we, we then really made sure we were trying to prioritize getting the, the survey results back to the folks inside the facility. So we were able to do that you know, um, a few months ago and, and then get some input from them. 
moving forward. And, and we're sort of collecting that information now about the feedback from the folks inside and really exploring that a little bit more deeply. Um, and, you know, I would highlight, like I don't wanna go through the whole survey because it's huge. Um, you know, I would highlight some of the key findings that stood out to us um, really around the domains of sort of relationships, um, decision-making, idle time in the facility uh, and, and around mental health impacts. And I know that we anticipate um, doing this survey again um, in June of 2022 and then annually um, thereafter uh, it, as part of the project. Uh, and we will also be complementing it with more qualitative um, focus groups and interviews as well. So really helping to measure longitudinally the impact um, over time of any changes that are made. So um, Kathy, anything else we should add? Um, well, you covered it pretty well. Um, I guess the only thing I would add that I think is important for the committee to know is that um, our survey was really long. It was uh, more than 150 questions for both staff and incarcerated. Um, and, you know, we were a little concerned about uh, people's bandwidth for completing it. Um, but uh, people mentioned to us that they felt respected by that, by the fact that it was so detailed and wasn't just a cursory, uh, you know, ask about prisons that we really got into the nitty gritty. And um, so we were really gratified by that, um, especially with such a high response rate and such a, um, a you know, high number of um responses that we could use. Um, and then uh, the other thing I just want to point out is that um, we were um, given autonomy by DOC in terms of the questions we asked. They didn't try to uh, interfere or influence what we asked or didn't ask. Um, and, uh, you know, to maintain this arm's length independence, which is really important for uh, both validity and also credibility and everything else. Um, and, and we just wanted to call that out that we appreciated that because, um, it, you know, it, it's a, a challenging process for any uh, system to go through. So that's all I wanted to say. Thanks. So I think it's really time to start going through the survey because I think the committee wants to get into the nitty gritty as well. So I don't know who's gonna be walking us through this survey, but I know that there is probably gonna be a lot of questions as we proceed here. So I don't know who will present the survey. Are you looking for the survey results specifically or the survey questions? document in front of us and I think it would be good if someone could sort of go through the survey somewhat so we can ask questions and process it. Uh, Karen? Uh, and this is maybe a context question with it because I have previewed the, the survey results already so I feel like I have an understanding. I'm curious if you could help give context so we have these survey results and how they connect to the next phase. Like, I'm curious what's gonna be done with these results um, and how that's gonna turn into innovation. Like, who is the group that's going to be reviewing this? How is that gonna be made? What's the timeline? Um, so that's, that's for me. Um, so I don't know if you can just give that context before we decide where we're gonna go with the results. Uh, I can start if you'd, if you'd like. Um, so there, um, there are a couple of different bodies that um, we've created around this project. So um, most of the people that you're talking to right now are on uh, a steering committee, right? So we, we have been meeting, I think, you know, twice a month um, as we've gone through the project um, to just manage the logistics of everything. Um, and then there is an executive steering committee and Representative Emmons indicated, you know, that she's been part of that committee. And that's a group of um, stakeholders um, who we've also been engaging through the course of the project on, I think, about a quarterly basis. Internal to um, Southern, and this is where Brad's position is really pivotal, is uh, we're creating um, innovation councils. 
And the innovation councils will be made up of um, incarcerated population uh, and uh, staff at the facility. And those councils are going to, and they have already been engaging, as Abby said, you know, the, um, you know, the people who live and work at Southern uh, were the, you know, amongst the first to see the survey results and have already started to respond back to us with, you know, ideas for, for innovations. But we'll be launching, um, you know, or continuing to launch these efforts of the innovation councils where we'll be gathering ideas and input from them what are the ideas that they have? And then, you know, working through those um, innovations and trying as many as we can, given the conditions that we're in um, and testing them out. And this is where also our partners at UVM are gonna be really helpful because they're going to be with us along the way to assess, you know, the impact of those results. Um, so I feel like it's, um, it's, a, it's an iterative process, um, and, you know, and some of the things that we're going to start could be, you know, um, some small, simple things um, and that could have a really big impact. Uh, and some things may be much larger and require a lot more effort and planning and training um, and resources uh, to complete. Um, but one thing that we're committed to doing is, is tracking all of those, being clear about those and having a really um, uh, commitment to the participatory process that, I, that you know, Jesse explained you know, so well. Um, and that's going to be happening over the course of the next few years of the project. And we'll also be informed by um, the readministration of the, the climate survey. And I'm, I'm so happy to have others ahead. from the department chime in there, but. <laughs> Here. I think the committee would really like to go through the survey. And, and Alice, I've got a question. And hold on, Mary, a minute. I, I think that we, we're really appreciative of all this background information, but the rubber hits the road when you did the survey. And there's some disturbing results here that I think the committee would like to vet um, and go through some of this survey, because that's what this testimony is for, is to go through the survey. It's not the yeah. high level view, it's to get into the nitty gritty and then to figure out about the innovative piece going forward. But the piece that really comes through pretty clearly is that both staff and offenders uh, have some real concerns. And some of that is how valued they feel. Uh, some of that is their mental health and uh, emotional supports. And I think we need to dig deeper into this. So I'd like to get into the survey because I don't want to run out the clock here and talk about the philosophy of it. So Mary, you had a question and then I know- My, only, my only quick question was, how was it presented last week to the group that you presented? I'm a little challenged that there's five or six of you here and you're kind of wondering how this is going to be presented to us. So how was it presented last week? I think I can address that question, uh, Representative. So the survey results were provided to the incarcerated and the staff populations at Southern State actually much earlier, a couple of months ago when we when we were finalizing the documents because they were the participatory uh, research partners with, with the team here. Last week, we released the results uh, first to our staff um, and then conducted a town hall meeting with the entire department on Wednesday. And then on Thursday morning, the results were released to the media and we had a media availability on Thursday to discuss with them the results themselves. Um, so to Representative Emmons uh, request, I'd be happy to walk us through the document that you have. Uh, and then with some help from my friends, we can dig into any of the salient details that, you, that you'd like to discuss, or we can talk about the department's plans on, on how to address some of this uh, aside from the innovations that they plan. Okay, that Thanks. would be great. Thank you. We only have about 20 minutes left, mm -hmm. so we may continue mm -hmm. and reschedule this so we can do a deeper dive. Okay. Absolutely. Um, so on the document that you have in front of you, if you orient yourself to the numbered page three, it shows up in mine uh, on the deck as, as page four, but this lays out the, the demographics of the population that was studied. Um, 
I, I doubt you have too many questions about that, but it's an interesting cross section to, to look at as gives the context of, of who was participating. Um, if we then move to numbered page four, we begin to get into the categories uh, of questions and the responses we got back. So the first category is job satisfaction. Um, I think a couple of things really stuck out to me on this uh, section, and that is the issues that we face within the department as it relates to staff are not related around pride in their in their position. I think what these results show to me is that people really do take pride in their, their job at the Department of Corrections and, and believe in the mission of the department. Where we start to see uh, more challenges is in promotions, um, is in leadership and communications, which I think underpin a lot of the results we're seeing here. Um, did, did you have any questions about this section or we can keep moving? Just, I wanna make sure we're responsive to you, but cover any parts of this that you um, would like to discuss. I think we can keep moving. Okay, so the next section is reflections on the Department of Corrections and particularly the central office. So our, our kind of headquarters component here. Um, again, I think this, this highlights a lot of challenges in the central office's ability or, or effectiveness in communicating with the staff uh, across the system. Um, I think what I learned in reading some of the, these results is people, the, the staff in the department don't feel that they are involved in decision making and they don't feel that um, they understand the why as to why the department does certain things that it does. And so to me, a lot of that comes back to communication and to engagement with the staff. Um, and, and I think the survey results reflect that, that the staff did not feel particularly engaged uh, in the processes, uh, particularly decision-making that's done at the central office. And I think that's the thing that we as this committee have heard over the past couple of years. So in seeing this result, it's not a surprise to many of us, but it is concerning in that there does seem to be a disconnect between central office and the boots on the ground. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this survey result provided us kind of scientific information, scientific data to work off of. But I could have told you that this was this was happening within the system before seeing the print results, just having visited the facilities and talked to our staff on the ground there. There clearly is a disconnect between the central office and the facilities. And so I'm, I'm curious to see if uh, Prin takes this on as, as areas for innovation, but irrespective of that, I know that this extends beyond Southern State, and it's something that the department itself needs to tackle system-wide, and, and that's incumbent on me to do that. And so um, we're going to work on some initiatives to improve communication, to enhance our communication, to create new avenues for the frontline staff to be able to communicate, and then it's incumbent on the central office to communicate back the what are we doing and why are we doing it? And wherever we can, we need to build in engagement with the staff so that they have um, their views heard, they feel engaged in the process, they can communicate back to us uh, with their own ideas. And that's something that I've asked frequently during our town halls, during engagements at the facilities that, that people send ideas and, and we really, spend time discussing challenges so that it's not just the central office dictating policy that we really take into account the, the real life experiences of staff on the ground in the facilities and in the field uh, as well. Alice, I have a question. I'm Mary. Um, Commissioner, I'm just wondering, do you have a somewhat of a time frame or some thoughts on that? Because I know like uh, our chair has said, We've been hearing a lot of these issues for a number of years, and I know you're going to kind of con be continuing with this process with the survey, but when, does the, when do the boots hit the ground and we actually see some change in better communication and engagement, and so that we're kind of all working together? What is your um, thoughts on that and, and how long this will take. I know the survey just came out, but again, um, you're talking about other uh, kind of additional survey information you'll be gathering, but when is it likely we might start seeing some positive changes? 
Yeah, it's a great question. Thank you, Representative. So I think there's a kind of a two part answer to that. Uh, the first part is the, the PRIN effort itself. And I think we want to respect the integrity of this process and allow them the space to do their innovations. But that will certainly take some time as we just now move into that phase. The second part of my answer, though, is the department itself needs to take on particularly this communication and engagement issue with our staff. Um, and we're doing that right now. Um, next week, uh, we have our, our monthly town hall scheduled with our entire staff. And during that town hall, I plan to outline a few new initiatives that we'll be launching next week to engage staff and improve communication. Um, I would prefer to discuss that with them, but I would be happy to then come discuss it with you all uh, and outline some of the initial steps we're taking. Um, from there then, uh, we hope to build more structured long-term kind of systemic changes to the system to, to ensure that that communication and that engagement with staff uh, can occur and is really codified within the structure of the department. Um, so I guess that ended up being three parts. One is that the innovations from PRIN will happen beginning soon and will carry on for a couple of years. The second part is the department is, is looking to address this system-wide immediately. And then we hope to build a longer term strategy to enhance communication within the system. Well, I will look forward to that and I will hold your feet to the fire because we've heard similar um, promises of this over the years and we haven't quite gotten there. So I'll appreciate any movement you can make on this. Absolutely. And I appreciate that. I hope you really will keep me honest on that. It's, it's clearly, as this survey demonstrates, and as my conversations demonstrate, a, a salient and, and pain point for our staff uh, out in the field in the facilities. We have another question here, Karen, and then Larry. Yeah, then so Michelle. I think I um, am similar with Mary where she's at, and I, coming from the new legislative perspective, maybe I have more, <laughs> like a pot, like this is gonna happen, right? Yeah. Um, because I'm seeing it, it's like, I'm not surprised by this data. Um, with my experience with you and just the conversations we've had. So um, what I'm hoping is that when the report comes out next year, there's going to be a shift in it. And I guess I'm feeling hopeful that now there's a tool to measure it. So it's not just going to be anecdotes and stories. Like there's now a tool that's going to measure this, that we can hold that accountability. Um, so I'm looking forward to, to that piece of it. And it's uh, helpful to hear that there's these different prongs that are going to be taking this data and moving it into action because that's really what we're all looking for is seeing success in our department of corrections my question is because i agree that transparency is key with this of giving everybody the information like so we're all about it um do the other uh facilities did they get detailed access to this information in question so i feel like What's happening in Springfield is one thing, but I'm guessing in the other facilities, they're gonna be like, oh uh, yeah, yeah, that's true for us too. So was there similar conversations at other facilities? So the survey and the results are limited to Southern state. Th those came from the research done at Southern state. I think the, the official answer is we can't necessarily extrapolate that to the whole system. I would say, you know, my answer, the unofficial answer is I think th this clearly reflects commonalities across the facilities and the system. And I think we can see that we, we have other data points that we can lean into that demonstrate that as well. The results themselves, the, the same document that you were all seeing was shared with the entire staff. Um, and so other facilities did have the opportunity to look at this data. Uh, and during the town hall, we had an opportunity to discuss it and had a, a question and answer session, not dissimilar from this. Um, and so everybody in the department and, and, and really everybody in the state of Vermont and nationwide could look at these results now because they have been published, but we did share it with staff before we made it public. Um, on your first point, um, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, and I think in my opening remarks, what I really tried to highlight there is I want this system to be better. Um, we, we have a lot of room to improve, uh, but we can't do that unless we have the tools in place that really give us the facts and, and help us to understand the challenges. I think too often we think we know what the problem is and we think we know what will fix it. And in fact, we're, we're not getting to the root issues. And so this, this effort provides us with the, the real data that we need to be able to 
understand our problem sets, and then begin to design the, the meaningful changes that I think we all want. And so while I agree and understand that people in my position have come here before and said we're going to make meaningful change, uh, and perhaps I will fail also, I hope not. And I think we're the department is completely and entirely committed to getting the tools in place to actually make those meaningful changes. Um, and I think that's the direction we're going. That's the direction the governor wants us to go. It's the direction the secretary wants us to go. I know that's what this body wants us to do. Um, and so hopefully I am here to, to help everybody get to that point and, and, and get the structure in place to be able to make those meaningful changes. Larry and then Michelle. Commissioner, this is Representative Labor. Um, there's several glaring um, parts of this survey. Hard left blue, hard right red. But some of that, I think, um, could easily be jump-started without a big budget. Mm -hmm. It's mostly in communication mm -hmm. and style of leadership. Mm -hmm. Have you address this with your staff to look for the low hanging fruit that you could do first and make the biggest impact. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a great question. I could not agree with you more. Um, somebody, somebody recently asked, I can't remember if it was in this committee or another, I apologize. Um, are you going to need budget to, to accomplish all of this? And certainly there will be some budget tail to some of it, but I agree with you that I think many of the, many of the challenges we see within these results can be resolved with, the existing budget we have or won't require large budget lines anyway. It's, it's communication, it's leadership, it's structural changes um, to ensure that people feel heard and respected and valued. Um, those things don't, don't necessarily require those large budget lines. And so um, I, I agree with you and uh, the staff uh, you know, the team here and my executive team have sat and, and poured over these results and, and had conversation after conversation about how we do this. We also met with our counterparts in, in BSEA and our labor management groups here within the department to discuss what are some, obviously there are big ticket items, budget uh, type items that, that relate to benefits and pensions and things of that nature, but there are also small, small ticket or small bucket items that are simple. That if you did this, it would make people feel better. Well, then let's group all those together and start pushing those out. And so that will also be part of our presentation next week to the staff. And I'd be happy to come back and, and discuss those things with you. Um, I agree that we can do a lot of those little things quickly, easily, uh, with low cost, um, and, and they will help us to move the needle and, and relieve some of the pressure on the staff. Thank you, Commissioner. I've got a follow up on that. I don't, you know, that's fine with the current folks you may have now in central office. What happens when those folks change? How do you ensure that those tools that you've put in place in the communication piece that then ties into the culture of each facility, how can we ensure that that is continuous regardless of who's sitting in central office? That's a great question. Um, you know, I think we can design a structure that that addresses much of this, uh, particularly around communications um, and engagement and, and breaking down some of the barriers between the central office and the field, the central office and the facilities, the the barriers between the field and the facilities. We can we can do that structurally. Um, how that remains codified for the future. I think it remains to be seen a little bit. I'd be interested in having a conversation with you about that. I think the best that I can do is, is get the department positioned for success on those things and hand off whenever that may come to fruition, um, a, a department that's, that is succeeding in those areas and has the structure in place to help the next person continue to build on our progress. Um, but ultimately, much of that, I think, does fall to the discretion of the commissioner, um, and and hopefully our leadership selects commissioners who are committed to that type of culture change, positive interaction with staff, uh, wanting to make those meaningful connections, wanting to humanize the staff and value them as human beings in addition to valuing them as as dedicated members to the team here. Thank you. 
Um, but if the, if the committee has ideas about how we more permanently structure that, I'd be happy to engage on, on those topics. Yeah, sure. yeah uh, thanks uh, for presenting on this. The, the data, some of the data is really disturbing, but it's also really valuable for us to know what are these areas where we really need to make improvement. But I guess I have a question about, because the huge majority of this has been gathered during COVID, how can we um, how can we pay attention to that and know what was a problem before COVID and what you know how can we make changes to, to factor that in? I mean, I know at Springfield, I worked with a number of individuals who who resided at Springfield uh, when I worked at the Community Justice Center, and there were a lot of great programs that were happening there that stopped because of COVID. Mm -hmm. There were support group and recovery programs. There were religious programs that happened in person. All of that has stopped. Family vis visits changed. So how, so the first question is how can we factor in what happened with COVID and what we can change? The second part is how can we perhaps do something to address the needs that people have right now while COVID is still an issue? Because people being in lockdown all but 15 minutes of the day, maybe they need that to protect from COVID, but maybe we need to do something else to try and meet their mental health and, and other need areas. So if you could speak to those, I would be appreciating it. Certainly, uh, you know, I would welcome my colleagues here to weigh in on the point about how, how we deal with this as a survey taken during COVID and then as we move forward and hopefully out of or at least into the endemic phase of COVID. There are some things that we know predated the COVID-19 pandemic, our staffing challenges, for example, the, the communication breakdown or lack of communication between central and the field and facilities. Those things are long running storylines and, and trend lines in the department. And so we have to address those either way. I think the other point of this that while the survey was taken during the pandemic, uh, the, the ground has shifted on us. The world post pandemic will be totally different than the world pre pandemic. And so um, we're gonna have to adapt to our new reality and, and it gives us opportunity to, to build for the future um, but we're going to face staff, staffing challenges when the pandemic ends, uh, as we do while the pandemic is, is still going. Um, so those are areas that we're going to have to focus on um, very heavily. And I'll, I'll let my colleagues speak to that if, if they're interested in just a second. But um, on the second point, um, we do have to do some things immediately to address the mental, emotional, physical health of the facilities. And I think as we move towards the endemic phase of the pandemic, or I guess at that point we'd be in the endemic, um, we, we need to evaluate uh, our mitigations that we have in place to determine if they aren't now outweighed by the mental, emotional, physical toll that they're taking. Um, we have a hugely vaccinated and boosted population, both of the incarcerated and staff. Uh, much like the state does as a whole. And so with those protections in place, can we start to draw back some of the mitigations in order to account for the mental health needs, the physical health needs, the emotional health needs of the incarcerated, but also our staff? I mean, I think what this survey says is both populations are being dramatically affected by a, a litany of mental health, emotional health, physical health challenges. Um, and so we can discuss some of the things that we're doing immediately on that front, but but it's certainly, it, we're beginning to move towards the endemic phase and, and there will be changes in the system that need to happen uh, as we get there. Um, but but if any of my colleagues wanted to comment on the COVID phase uh, and the point in time nature of the study. This is Jesse, if I may add on to that. I mean, there's a couple of thoughts. I mean, one is coming back to this capacity point. If this data collection is a sustained practice, then when we're several years down the road, the fact that we started it during the COVID period will not be as critical to understanding because we will have you know, trend over time. The second thing I would say is this survey data is a rich and valuable source of what we know, but we 
do not have to and will not proceed as though it's the only thing we know. Um, again, you know, among other things, this is where whether it's the some of the qualitative work around focus groups and interviews that Abby had mentioned that was already done is helpful. The participatory work will help if you look at the demographics of the staff who took the survey. Many of them have been working in the department for a while. And as we're sitting down with them and thinking about what this means and what we need to do, they will bring in the knowledge that they have of a longer time horizon um, for the organization. So, I mean, and, and also, I mean, I think some of these situations that we're seeing, I think particularly around mental health, stress, you know, trauma exposure are caused by the pandemic or at least exacerbated by it. I mean, those are things that are, you know, prevalent in cor correctional environments all over the country, but there are also impacts that are not going to recede by themselves simply because the public health situation gets better as we all hope it will like you know with anything with trauma when there's damage done specific proactive actions have to be taken to alleviate that and we still need to measure to see whether that whether we you know have reason to believe that some of the things we may come in that are, are being effective you know the, the 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 change in time period isn't going to magically solve you know or or you know mitigate some of these problems like we'll collectively have to do that. So hopefully that is that is helpful. I mean, it is it is, uh, you know, certainly a challenge that we have to think about. And it's, you know, but when when you start work, you have to start it with the time that you're given um, and you have to start somewhere. And this is, you know, it's it's tragic all the way around that this is the environment that we had to start in and that we have. But this is our time that we got. So, I'll just have one more OK, Mary, I, I just wanted to you know, in reviewing the report and that, and I'll be obviously interested to hear all the comments that you all have, but I think a lot of the mental health issues and that, the, I should say more of the uh, probably enhanced mental health and issues amongst our staff and, you know, concerns in their health and all of that is a lot due to the fact of the, um, staffing challenges and kind of crisis. Like we said, there was a problem before COVID, and I think it's just been enhanced since COVID. So, you know, the uh, obviously communication and engagement is important, but I think the staffing crisis needs to be somehow addressed, you know, kind of up there on the priority. Do you have any thoughts at this point how to do that? Yeah, thank you, Representative. So I, I view these as two separate but related problems. There is a staff problem and there is a staffing problem. The staff problem is the, the individual human beings that comprise the department's staff do not feel valued, engaged, communicated with. Um, they don't feel that the department is investing in them as people or in their careers. That is one set of problems that, that I need to address. And I am beginning uh, to address those things and we have strategy in place to do that. The second part is we have a staffing problem. We, we simply do not have enough people to maintain the system the way we want to. And so we need to increase those numbers. And we can do that through a couple of different ways. One, we have to retain the excellent talent that we already have. And then we need to go out and recruit uh, new talent. And so in order to do that, we need a system that people want to come work for, uh, that they are told by current members of the staff, it's a good place to work. The, the pay and benefits are good. The department treats you well. Uh, they're invested in you as human beings. Um, and, and these things are, are interconnected. And so we do have a strategy in place to get after both of those problem sets. Um, but it, it's going to be heavily focused on professional development, uh, a, a department investing in the professionals in our, uh, on our staff to show them that we care about them, care about their career, and want them to stay in the department. It's going to be focused heavily on staff wellness. And so that gets to the mental, emotional, physical health issues we were just talking about and providing them wraparound services that help support their whole life, not just their life within the department. Um, and then it's going to be focused on communication and process improvement. As, as we see throughout these survey results, many people do not feel that the promotion process is fair. Many people do not feel involved or communicated with uh, on a whole litany of topics within the department. So if we can work to improve those things and we provide the professional development, the staff wellness, 
Um, those things coupled with the work we do separately on benefits, pay, um, all taken together will help us to move the needle on the staff and staffing challenges that we're facing. Thank you, and I will look forward to your timely updates. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, in looking at timely uh, situations, it's past 12 o'clock. I know that there's a lot more questions for this survey, so I would like to schedule some further time for this because I know some committee members do want to do a, a deeper dive, and we've only touched the beginning piece of the survey in terms of the communication piece. And the communication piece is vital to our staff feeling valued and developing trust, both in their work environment and trust that central office has their back. So those further conversations and some of that may not um, involve legislative work, it's work from the department, but how do you keep that in place regardless of who's there? And other parts of this involve that some of the facilities were understaffed to begin with when they first opened up, Southeast being one, and that is a real budget implication that the legislature needs to grapple with. And the other piece, if you're talking about classification of correctional officers and their pay grade, and their benefits, again, that's where the legislature needs to be involved in appropriations committees as well. So we need to stop because we have other commitments happening. So we're gonna need to reschedule to continue this conversation and continue going through the survey with this. Any closing thoughts from you folks before we break for lunch. I just simply say that I appreciate the opportunity to, to be here with our partners and discuss this with you. And certainly we welcome a future opportunity to discuss it again. Um, and, and as we move down this process, we'd be happy to share all of the activity, the, the work and the process improvements that we're putting in place uh, so that you're aware and, and can help us measure those and, and make them permanent where they're working well. That'd be great. So thank you, folks. I know this is a chunk, big chunk out of your day, but thank you. Thank you for giving us the background of the PRIN project, the Urban Institute, UVM. Thank you for the help that you've done on this and being a partnership. Um, it's been very uh, fruitful in terms of the information and it validates a lot that we have heard over the past few years, even pre-COVID this validates what we've been hearing in testimony. So I, I really appreciate that. And the committee does as well. So thank you folks. And uh, for folks on YouTube, we will be back this afternoon uh, at one o'clock and we will be shifting gears and talking with our state treasurer about bonding issues and capital expenditures. So we're shifting gears back to our capital budget. So thank you folks on YouTube. Thank you folks for coming in and testifying on the print report and uh, for YouTube.